Whenever we discuss about the British Empire, we find two main groups of arguers, one who argue in favor of it and one who argue against it. But there can be found a common statement between both the groups that it is a thing of the past and dealing with it much will do no good. Now I do agree with the first part of the statement that it is a thing of the past but with the second part do I disagree. But wait a second, if reviving of its memories leads to some sort of anger or hatred within you then it will obviously do no good and I will request you to stop watching this video right here. Then obviously the question arises how and why should we look at the British Raj. The answer to this question we will provide at the end of this video when we will discuss the purpose behind this particular video. But before that let us look at some myths, the strongest myths about the British Raj that are circulated in our country even today. Keep watching this video until the end as we break down these points for you. And if you are new to this channel, please do consider subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon down below so that you don't miss updates of such incisive videos in the future. With that being done, let's move on to the video. To understand this myth, we first need to look at why and how the present education system, which was the one implemented by the British, was introduced to us in the first place. When the British arrived in the 18th century and started conquering territories on our land and expanding their trade, they naturally encountered with the problem of communication, communicating with us locals. Because there were a number of different cultures and languages spread across our land. And so they naturally thought of introducing English, which would enable them to communicate with us in a far easier manner. As Thomas Macaulay had said, form a class of Indians who would act as interpreters between us and the millions of people whom we govern. Mind it, English was never introduced to educate us. You don't need to look far for evidence behind this. Even today, there are a number of Indian families who for generations have not known English a bit. You, you will find that in, you know, in and around you, in your society or uh, even on social media, many people still plead influencers who maybe talk in English to converse with them in local languages because the ones who are watching the video are not comfortable with English. So this is evidence behind the fact that English was not a language that was taught widespread. Besides the introduction of English reduced the importance of learning the local languages, the other local languages which were prevalent in our country. And this phenomena is one from which we suffer still now. Still now you will find people who take pride in, you know, not knowing Indian languages and showing off that we know English so much, we, we are of a different class and status in society. This is a direct consequence of the importance of English which was introduced by the British and it subsequently brought down the importance of learning the local languages. Next, we shall talk about the decreased importance on art subjects. Now, when the British started settling themselves on our land, they naturally required Indians who would have a basic technical knowledge and they, they had no use for Indians having uh, knowledge in art subjects like poetry and history. They, they, they had no use of such Indians. They only wanted Indians who would have a basic knowledge in science, technology and who could work for them like robots in their industries. And this was the reason which started distancing our people from the art subjects. Even when providing technical knowledge, they made it sure that no language more than the basic amount was provided to the Indian masses, which would make them less equipped to form an uprising against them, which obviously they did not want to happen. And the most important characteristic of today's education system, which is the importance of marks and the grading system, this was introduced by the British. This system was never prevalent in pre-colonial India. And today's mentality which we have in India, that marks or grades are the sole marker of judging talent in society, this, was, this mentality was introduced by the British. They introduced this education system to manufacture robots out of Indian masses and make education a competition for jobs, which is still the norm in India. 
even after so many years of independence we still think that studying is only for getting jobs and we refuse to divulge in knowledge other than the course curriculum or syllabus as we call it now we need to understand the problem over here this system of education benefited the british very much but even after 74 years of independence we have not been able to recognize this faulty education system rather it has only worsened over time just after independence with the introduction of iits in the country the importance of technical education was tightened and this distant the art subjects further from the mainstream public which was already which had already started during the british rule and the mentality of studying just for the sake of jobs only worsened after independence because when the british had arrived we were a country that contributed 23% of the world's gdp and when they left we were contributing to under 3% of the world's gdp you you can imagine the amount of abject poverty all over the country when they left us and they also left us with a minimal 16% literacy so naturally people became mad about earning money and the importance of jobs increased and because iits were being introduced technical education was being stressed upon people naturally drifted towards studying engineering and science subjects rather than studying the other stream subjects all of this gradually over time has turned our education system into one where children from a very early age are pushed into a reckless preparation for success and selected career paths stuffed into their minds early on they are never even given the opportunity to recognize their own passion their own interests use their own creativity imagination and what does this success mean adhering to societal standards and taking up select professions that have been stamped the brand of success by society now you may have seen that when someone from our country makes it big in life like take for example sundar pichai or stalwart businessmen like ratan tata mukesh ambani when people like them make it make it to their dreams in life we start sharing their stories on social media everywhere with our family with our friends we start glorifying them as someone extraordinary now why is this we need to understand the root cause behind his behavior thinking big having big dreams is not the norm in our society these people who are making it big in life are just normal people like us everyone has that capability to make it big in life but our education system does not teach us to think big to have big aspirations and that's why when out of this education system some someone makes it big we start glorifying them as some superhuman now that was a lot about the problems of our education system now what are the solutions for this problem look changing the education system overnight is not possible it is a gradual process which takes up a lot of time and we obviously have to start working towards the change but it will take a lot of time and we can't sit back for that period of time because that time period might itself destroy the talents of many other people in our country so we need to practice some immediate solutions and what are those solutions first we need to understand that success means being happy with whatever you are doing success means that you take up profession you follow your passion and naturally you stay happy in your life that is success next we need to recognize diversification of skills even job sectors various job sectors today are wanting the same we need to understand a mature society is one where we have experts in all types of fields science commerce arts literature filmmaking and everything you can think of next parents and teachers need to encourage the habit of running after knowledge in students and children from a very young age we need to teach them and develop a habit in them to always whichever work we are doing be it studies or be it some co curricular activity each and every activity we are immersing ourselves in 
we need to divulge deep and know about the core of the subject we also need to encourage children to have a risk taking mentality in life you may have seen that this is a very common feature of indian society where guardians always teach children to have a attitude towards making their lives safe and secure now this safe and secure attitude makes us think small where we could have made it much bigger in life had we used our creativity had we taken risks had we used our ideas had we gone forward with our ideas this is the thing which we are missing out on and this missing out is making our country backward in a lot of areas we ourselves are aware of this take for the example of sports we often crib about why we are so backward in a number of sports but we ourselves do not let our children take up sports as a career it's a big irony isn't it and many of these solutions have in fact been stated in the recent national education policy of 2020 we have made a detailed analysis of the same uh, we will link it up here if you want you can go watch it under this head we shall be discussing the following points number 1 destruction of indian industries number 2 racism number 3 lgbtq community and the taboo around sex education we have clubbed these two different topics in one point you will get to know the reason a while later and number 4 discrimination against women starting with the first point there are still many who claim that the british taught us industrialization and trade but evidence points otherwise in fact the india british entered was a largely commercializing one which was why the east india company was interested in trading with us in the first place our products were in demand in and outside india including britain there were instances where english textiles were passed off as indian in their country just to charge higher prices besides evidence also points towards how the british destroyed our existing industries including or mainly that of handloom and textile they set up buyer monopolies and started fixing the market prices so low that the weavers could hardly redeem maybe 80% of the cost of their production they imposed heavy import duties on indian textiles which entered britain and very low duties on the british textiles that entered india which led to the gradual cripple of these domestic industries moving on to the second point much of the rampant racism which we see today in our country is a direct consequence of the british raj now mind you the knowledge about various skin colors was already prevalent in pre colonial india but it was never a rampant marker of discrimination when the british arrived in india they brought with them a sense of biological superiority due to their white skin they justified their colonial rule by saying that they had the right to rule over inferior subjects this racist attitude started gradually settling in the minds of indians too and they started discriminating against their own darker skinned fellow indians this problem can be seen even today in the form of tv advertisements on social media and this is not just a problem in india this problem can be observed in the western world too including britain coming to the third point we will discuss two different heads under this the lgbtq community and sex education today the lgbtq community in india is one which is still ostracized heavily and though awareness about it is gaining ground it still has to travel a long way but the question is why is this condition so yes yet again this originated under the british rule the infamous section 377 of the indian penal code which was just struck down recently in 2018 by the supreme court of india was brought into force by the british in 1860 this law was based on the buggery act of 1533 which was enacted under the reign of king henry the 8th it defined buggery as an unnatural act against the will of god and man 
it criminalized homosexuality on the whole. In another Criminal Tribes Act of 1871, the British criminalized this community yet again. Now you can obviously gauge the effect these laws had on our country. The whole community was pushed on the back foot even by fellow Indians and which is something we still do. But this condition was completely different in pre-colonial India. Many historians have stated and have in fact provided evidence that a large or a wide range of acceptance and knowledge on gender was prevalent before the British rule. Examples of this lie in the erotic sculptures depicting homosexuality in the Khajuraho temples of the 11th century in Madhya Pradesh, 13th century Sun Temple in Konark, the Ajanta and Ilora caves in Maharashtra and many more. Ancient Indian texts including the epics of Ramayana and Mahabharata have mention of this community. Even Islamic texts, some written by the emperors themselves such as Babur, do we find acceptance of this community and the high and respectable position they held in society actually. The same exact scenario lies with sex education in India. The book Kama Sutra written during 400 BCE to 200 CE by philosopher Vatsayana is the best example of the wide prevalence of sex education in pre-colonial India which includes the Islamic rule period. The current day taboo around this topic is all thanks to the British Raj which brought into Indian society many regressive outlooks of the Victorian society. The menstrual struggle of women the taboo around the use of condoms and the dear concept of virginity which we see are so prevalent in our society today were never a part of pre-colonial India. Fourthly, the discrimination against women reached a high under the British rule. Yes, we must not forget that this phenomena did not start under the British rule, rather it was already prevalent in pre-colonial India with demonic practices like sati, child marriage, polygamy, female infanticide, torture on widows. But women did not have their lives any easier under the British. Although they banned sati and legalized widow remarriage, it was only after social reformers like Raja Ramon Roy pressurized them to bring in these laws as initially the British were never interested in reforming the Indian society. They also promoted male dominance in Indian society, providing them with greater rights in legal or marital affairs. In the Victorian society, women were considered passive and physically weaker and best suited to stay at home. They were barred from many educational disciplines and were only allowed to study painting, music and few languages. Sometimes they were even barred from voting. A goal of a woman's life was only assumed to be marrying and having children. Both women who remained single and those who were forward in the company of men attracted social disapproval. Upon marrying, a woman completely lost whatever rights, whatever the smallest of rights and property she had and family wealth was always passed down the male line from which arise the very popular notion of women being a burden. A family rejoices when they have a male child and is completely dejected when they have a girl child. Now tell me something, don't these practices sound eerily similar to the present day Indian society or the post-colonial Indian society. There are still people in India who think that women are only there to serve men and don't deserve any freedom of their own. The discrimination against women, though it had started in the 15th, 16th century and that was before the British came in India, it was never as worse as in post-colonial Indian society. It worsened during the British rule and the subsequent Talking about territorial unity, there are a number of arguments both for and against the statement that the British brought about the territorial unity of our country and forming an opinion on the same is quite difficult. In the articles listed down below in our description, you can find some arguments for that 
and if you do your own research you will find quite a lot of new arguments and you can you're free to form your own opinion on it but when people talk about unity they forget the real meaning of it and that being the unity among the people of our country which brings us to this discussion under this segment we will discuss two major aspects of indian society that were influenced by the british rule number 1 the caste system and number 2 the relationship between hindus and muslims the two majorly practiced religions in our country now this segment is similar to the discrimination against women we just talked about that is the problems of the caste system in india and the clashes between hindus and muslims did not wholly originate under the british rule but obviously worsened under it firstly coming to the caste system known originally as the varna system is known to have its origins in the manusmriti an ancient indian text now the purpose behind this system was never one of discrimination rather it was brought up with the intention of classifying one's duties in society and establishing order and prevent the encroachment on one's life and duties by another person now we must remember that any kind of classification however good intentions it may have is bound to give rise to some unfair discrimination as people slowly start getting corrupt and start taking advantage and this is what started to occur by the end of the vedic period problems started gradually arising over time but they did not reach a head until the british rule up until the raj the caste system was not widespread there were obviously certain areas of problem where the caste system had relevance but otherwise they were not they were barely considered by the locals and even evidence points towards this those who were slaves became kings kings became farmers social identities were quite flexible now when the british arrived and discovered the existence of such a system even though not solid they found it exactly fulfilling their needs they figured that consolidating this caste system and making it widespread will make it easier for them to create friction between indians themselves and achieve their divide and rule policy upper caste people upper caste people started getting more privileges and the word achhut started becoming popular for lower castes and the agony of which we dreadfully suffer even today and there are people of our country who still actively fuel this caste mentality coming to the rift between hindus and muslims pre colonial india had mixed characteristics on the one hand it is a fact that the british did not invent the differences between hindus and muslims and there had been periods of serious conflicts between these two religious communities before they came in but on the other hand hindus and muslims coexisting and influencing each other's cultures to create a certain level of harmony also could be seen but in the light of arguing that the british were not creators of this rift many overlooked the contribution they had to it and by it i mean considerable contribution during the uprising of 1857 the british were scared to see that the muslims and hindus in spite of previous differences had come together to revolt against them and the first thing they started doing after the transfer of power from the east india company to the crown in 1857 was promoting communal rifts throughout their reign they thrived on their divide and rule policy they constantly tried to separate the muslims from nationalist movements the cruel bengal partition in 1905 the morley minto reforms of 1909 which were aimed at forming separate electorates for muslims and the partition of india in 1947 which led to murder rape and mob lynching on a scale rarely seen before were based exactly on this policy and were successful to a large extent in increasing the differences between these two communities sadly after independence instead of trying and healing the wounds or scars left by the british raj our countrymen still actively practice this religious divide and religious conflicts in our country are more or less becoming a common occurrence now all these flaws certainly do not point towards a civilized society 
it is important to acknowledge that the british never did more than what was necessary to fortify their own footing in the country and so the structure was far from planned and organized in fact 19th century british india was reduced to an alarmingly famine prone society with decreasing healthcare and literacy so much so that there have been accounts of british officers cutting themselves off from day to day lives of indians keeping themselves distracted from the acute suffering of indians out of their own guilt feeling this is the most important part of this video why are we looking at this myths as i said in the introduction many people not wanting to meddle in the colonial past often overlook these myths of the empire that are propagated actively in our country even today which brings us to the purpose behind this video which is to point out the scars left by them on our society and the need to recognize them because knowingly or unknowingly we instead of healing these wounds are intensifying them each passing day and as they say in order to solve a problem you first need to recognize that exists one knowing about them becoming aware about them will inspire more and more people to make others aware about it and look for solutions which is the greatest need of this hour we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of our independence day but even though we are physically independent we are not even close to becoming mentally independent it's high time we come together and break away from these shackles and walk towards a free india so that's it for this video if you are still here with us we thank you wholeheartedly for that and we are quite confident that you must have found some value from this video if so then please do like and share this video share it with everyone spread the knowledge spread the awareness and subscribe to our channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon down below we'll see you next time until then towards knowledge towards awareness wishing you a very fruitful and meaningful independence day